Pablo Emilio Escobar Gaviria, 1 December 1949, 2 December 1993, was a Colombian drug lord, narco-terrorist, and a politician who was the founder and sole leader of the Medellin cartel. Dubbed the king of cocaine, Escobar was the wealthiest criminal in history, having amassed an estimated net worth of us $30 billion by the time of his death, equivalent to $70 billion as of 2022 while his drug cartel monopolized the cocaine trade into the United States in the 1980s and early 1980s. Born in Rio Negro and raised in Medellin, Escobar studied briefly at Universidad Autónoma Latinoamericana of Medellin, but left without graduating. He instead began engaging in criminal activity, selling illegal cigarettes and fake lottery tickets, as well as participating in motor vehicle theft. In the early 1970s, he began to work for various drug smugglers, often kidnapping and holding people for ransom. In 1976, Escobar founded the Medellin Cartel, which distributed powder cocaine and established the first smuggling routes from Peru, Bolivia, and Ecuador through Colombia and eventually into the United States. Escobar's infiltration into the U.S. created exponential demand for cocaine, and by the 1980s, it was estimated Escobar led monthly shipments of 70 to 80 tons of cocaine into the country from Colombia. As a result, he quickly became one of the richest people in the world, but constantly battled rival cartels domestically and abroad, leading to massacres and the murders of police officers, judges, locals, and prominent politicians, making Colombia the murder capital of the world in the 1982. Colombian parliamentary election Escobar was elected as an alternate member of the Chamber of Representatives as part of the liberal alternative movement. Through this, he was responsible for community projects such as the construction of houses and football fields, which gained him popularity among the locals of the towns that he frequented. However, Escobar's political ambitions were thwarted by the Colombian and U.S. Governments who routinely pushed for his arrest with Escobar widely believed to have orchestrated the Avianca Flight 203 and DAS building bombings in retaliation. In 1991, Escobar surrendered to authorities and was sentenced to five years imprisonment on a host of charges, but struck a deal of no extradition with Colombian President, with Colombian President Cesar Gaviria, with the ability of being housed in his own self-built prison, La Catedral. In 1992, Escobar escaped and went into hiding when authorities attempted to move him to a more standard holding facility, leading to a nationwide manhunt. As a result, the Medellin cartel crumbled, and in 1993, Escobar was killed in his hometown by Colombian National Police. A day after his 44th birthday, Escobar's legacy remains controversial. While many denounced the heinous nature of his crimes, he was seen as a Robin Hood figure for many in Colombia as he provided many amenities to the poor. His killing was mourned and his funeral attended by over 25,000 people. Additionally, his private estate, Hacienda Napoles, has been transformed into a theme park. His life has also served as inspiration for or has been dramatized widely in film, television, and in music. Pablo Emilio Escobar Gaviria was born on 1 December 1949 in Rio Negro, Antioquia Department. He was the third of seven children and grew up in poverty in the neighboring city of Medellin. His father was a small farmer and his mother was a small farmer and his mother was a teacher. Escobar left high school in 1966 just before his 17th birthday before returning two years later with his cousin Gustavo Gaviria. At this time, the hard life on the streets of Medellin had polished them into gangster bullies in the eyes of teachers. The two dropped out of school after more than a year, but Escobar, who did not give up, briefly became autonomous in Latin America by forging high school diplomas. He then studied in college with the goal of becoming a criminal lawyer, a politician, and eventually the president, but had to give up because of lack of money. Escobar started his criminal career with his gang by stealing tombstones, sandblasting their inscriptions, and reselling them. After dropping out of school, Escobar began to join gangs to steal cars. 
Escobar soon became involved in violent crime, employing criminals to kidnap people who owed him money and demand ransom, sometimes tearing up ransom notes even when Escobar had received the ransom. His most famous kidnapping victim was businessman Diego Echevarria, who was kidnapped and eventually killed in the summer of 1971. Escobar received a $50,000 ransom from the Echevarria family. His gang became well known for this kidnapping. Escobar had been involved in organized crime for a decade when the cocaine trade began to spread in Colombia in the mid-1970s. Escobar's meteoric rise caught the attention of the Colombian Security Service, DASU, who arrested him in May 1976 on his return from drug trafficking in Ecuador. EAS. Agents found 39 kg of cocaine in the spare tire of Escobar's car. Escobar managed to change the first judge in the lawsuit and bribed the second judge, so he was released along with other prisoners. The following year, the agent who arrested Escobar was assassinated. Escobar continued to bribe and intimidate Colombian law enforcement agencies in the same fashion. His carrot and stick strategy of bribing public officials and political candidates in Colombia, in addition to sending hitmen to murder the ones who rejected his bribes, came to be known as silver or lead, meaning money or debt. The Medellin cartel and the Cali cartel both managed to bribe Colombian politicians in both the New Liberalism Party and the Colombian Liberal Party via political donation. Hence, Escobar and many other Colombian drug lords were pulling strings in every level of the Colombian government because many of the political candidates whom they backed financially were eventually elected. Although the Medellin cartel was only established in the early 1970s, it expanded after Escobar met several drug lords on a farm in April 1978. And by the end of 1978, they had transported some 19,000 kilograms of cocaine to the United States. Soon, the demand for cocaine greatly increased in the United States, which led to Escobar organizing more smuggling shipments, routes, and distribution networks in South Florida, California, Puerto Rico, and other parts of the country. He and cartel co-founder Carlos Leder worked together to develop a new transshipment point in the Bahamas, an island called Norman's Cay, about 350 km, 220 mile, southeast of the Florida coast. According to his brother, Escobar did not purchase Norman's Cay. It was instead a sole venture of Leder's. Escobar and Robert Besco purchased most of the land on the island, which included a one kilometer. 3,300 airstrip, a harbor, a hotel, houses, boats, and aircraft, and they built a refrigerated warehouse to store the cocaine. From 1978 to 1982, this was used as a central smuggling route for the Medellin cartel. With the enormous profits generated by this route, Escobar was soon able to purchase 20 square kilometers, 7.7 squi, of land in Antioquia for several million dollars, on which he built the Hishenda Nepal. The luxury house he created contained a zoo, a lake, a sculpture garden, a private bullring, and other amenities for his family and the cartel. Escobar was also involved in philanthropy in Colombia and paid handsomely for the staff of his cocaine lab. Escobar spent millions developing some of Medellin's poorest neighborhoods. He helped build roads, power lines, and soccer fields. He also built housing complexes for the homeless. Escobar also entered politics in the 1970s and participated in and supported the formation of the Liberal Party of Colombia. In 1982, he successfully entered the Colombian Congress. Although only an alternate, he was automatically granted parliamentary immunity and the right to a diplomatic passport under Colombian law. At the same time, Escobar was gradually becoming a public figure, and because of his charitable work, he was known as Robin Hood Pazer. He alleged once in an interview that his fortune came from a bicycle rental company he founded when he was 16 years old. In Congress, the new Minister of Justice, Rodrigo Luara Bonilla, 
had become Escobar's opponent, accusing Escobar of criminal activity from the very first day of Congress. Escobar's arrest in 1976 was investigated by Laura, Bonilla's subordinate. A few months later, liberal leader Luis Carlos Galen expelled Escobar from the party. Although Escobar fought back, he announced his retirement from politics in January 1984. Three months later, Laura, Bonilla was murdered. The Colombian judiciary had been a target of Escobar throughout the mid-1980s. While bribing and murdering several judges, in the fall of 1985, the wanted Escobar requested the Colombian government to allow his conditional surrender without extradition to the United States. The proposal was initially answered in the negative, and Escobar subsequently founded and implicitly supported the Los Extraditable Organization, which aims to fight extradition policy. The Los Extraditable Organization was subsequently accused of participating in an effort to prevent the Colombian Supreme Court from studying the constitutionality of Colombia's extradition treaty with the United States in support of the 6 November 1985 far-left guerrilla movement that attacked the Colombian Judiciary Building and killed half of the justices of the Supreme Court. In late 1986, Colombia's Supreme Court declared the previous extradition treaty illegal due to being signed by a presidential delegation, not the presidential delegation, not the president. Escobar's victory over the judiciary was short-lived with new president Virgilio Barco Vargas having quickly renewed his agreement with the United States. Escobar still held the grudge against Luis Carlos Galen, who kicked him out of politics and was assassinated on 18 August 1989 at Escobar's orders. Escobar then planted a bomb on Avianca Flight 203 in an attempt to assassinate Galen's successor, Cesar Gaviria Trujillo, who missed the plane and survived. All 107 people were killed in the blast because two Americans were also killed in the bombing. The U.S. government began to intervene directly. After the assassination of Luis Carlos Galen, the administration of Cesar Gaviria moved against Escobar and the drug cartels. Eventually, the government negotiated with Escobar and convinced him to surrender and cease all criminal activity in exchange for a reduced sentence and preferential treatment during his captivity. Declaring an end to a series of previous violent acts meant to pressure authorities and public opinion, Escobar surrendered to Colombian authorities in 1991. Before he gave himself up, the extradition of Colombian citizens to the United States had been prohibited by the newly approved Colombian Constitution of 1991. This act was controversial as it was suspected that Escobar and other drug lords had influenced members of the Constituent Assembly in passing the law. Escobar was confined in what became his own luxurious private prison, La Catedral, which featured a football pitch, a giant dollhouse, a bar, a jacuzzi, and a waterfall. Accounts of Escobar's continued criminal activities while in prison began to surface in the media, which prompted the government to attempt to move him to a more conventional jail on 22 July 1992. Escobar's influence allowed him to discover the plan in advance and make a successful escape, spending the remainder of his life evading the police. In March 1976, the 26-year-old Escobar married Maria Victoria Hanayo, who was 15. The relationship was discouraged by the Hanayo family, who considered Escobar socially inferior. The pair eloped. They had two children, John Pablo, now Sebastian Mariquin. In 2007, the journalist Virginia Vallejo published her memoir, Amando a Pablo, Odiando a Mescobar, Loving Pablo, Hating Escobar, in which she describes her romantic relationship with Escobar and the links of her lover with several presidents, Caribbean dictators, and high-profile politicians. Her book inspired the movie Loving Pablo 2017, a drug distributor, Griselda Blanco, is also reported to have conducted a clandestine but passionate relationship with Escobar. Several items in her diary link him with the nicknames Coke de Mire, my Coke Gang, and Paula Blanca, White Cop. 
After becoming wealthy, Escobar created or bought numerous residences and safe houses with the Hacienda Napolese gaining significant notoriety. The luxury house contained a colonial house, a sculpture park, and a complete zoo with animals from various continents, including elephants, exotic birds, giraffes, and hippopotamuses. Escobar had also planned to construct a Greek-style citadel near it, and though construction of the citadel was started, it was never finished. Escobar also owned a home in the U.S. under his own name, a 6,500-square-foot, 602 pink waterfront mansion situated at 5,860 North Bay Road in Miami Beach, Florida. The four-bedroom estate built in 1948 on Biscayne Bay was seized by the U.S. federal government in the 1980s. Later, the dilapidated property was owned by Christian de Berdoir, proprietor of the Chicken Kitchen fast food chain, who had bought it in 2014. Deborah Duar would later hire a documentary film crew and professional treasure hunters to search the edifice before and after demolition for anything related to Escobar or his cartel. They would find unusual holes in floors and walls, as well as a safe that was stolen from its hole in the marble flooring before it could be properly examined. Escobar also owned a huge Caribbean getaway on Isla Grande, the largest of the cluster of the 27 coral cluster islands comprising Islas de Rosario, located about 35 Cam, 22 Mai, from Cartagena. The compound, now half demolished and overtaken by vegetation and wild animals, featured a mansion, apartments, courtyards, a large swimming pool, a helicopter landing pad, reinforced windows, tiled floors, and a large but unfinished building to the side of the mansion. Escobar faced threats from the Colombian police, the U.S. government, and his rival, the Cali Cartel. On 2 December 1993, Escobar was found in a house in a middle-class residential area of meddling by Colombian special forces using technology provided by the United States. Police tried to arrest Escobar, but the situation quickly escalated to an exchange of gunfire. Escobar was shot and killed while trying to escape from the roof. He was hit by bullets in the torso and feet and a bullet which struck him in the ear, killing him. This sparked debate about whether he killed himself or whether he was shot dead. Soon after Escobar's death and the subsequent fragmentation of the Medellin cartel, the cocaine market became dominated by the rival Cali cartel until the mid-1990s when its leaders were either killed or captured by the Colombian government. The Robin Hood image that Escobar had cultivated maintained a lasting influence in Medellin. Many there, especially many of the city's poor whom Escobar had aided while he was alive, mourned his death and over 25,000 people attended his funeral. Some of them consider him a saint and pray to him for receiving divine help. Escobar was buried at the Monte Sacro Cemetery. On 4 July 2006, Virginia Vallejo, a television anchor woman romantically involved with Escobar from 1983 to 1987, offered Attorney General Mario Igarin her testimony in the trial against former Senator Alberto Santofimio, who was accused of conspiracy in the 1989 assassination of presidential candidate Luis Carlos Gallen. Garin acknowledged that, although Vallejo had contacted his office on 4 July, the judge had decided to close the trial on 9 July, several weeks before the prospective closing date. The action was seen as too late. On 18 July 2006, Vallejo was taken to the United States on a special flight of the Drug Enforcement Administration, DEAD, EA, uh, for safety and security reasons due to her cooperation in high-profile criminal cases. On 24 July, a video in which Vallejo had accused Santo Fimio of instigating Escobar to eliminate presidential candidate Galen was aired by RRCNN Television of Colombia. The video was seen by 14 million people and was instrumental for the reopened case of Galen's assassination. On 31 August 2011, Santo Fimio was sentenced to 24 years in prison for his role in the crime. Among Escobar's biographers, only 
Vallejo has given a detailed explanation of his role in the 1985 Palace of Justice seat. The journalist stated that Escobar had financed the operation which was committed by M-19, but she blamed the army for the killings of more than 100 people, including 11 Supreme Court magistrates, M-19 members, and employees of the cafeteria. Her statements prompted the reopening of the case in 2008. Vallejo was asked to testify, and many of the events she had described in her book and testimonial were confirmed by Columbia's Commission of Truth. These events led to further investigation into the siege that resulted with the conviction of a high-ranking former colonel and a former general, later sentenced to 30 and 35 years in prison, respectively, for the forced disappearance of the detained after the siege. Vallejo would subsequently testify in Galen's assassination. In her book, Amando a Pablo Odiando a Escobar, Loving Pablo, Hating Escobar, she had accused several politicians, including Colombian presidents Alfonso Lopez, Mickelson Ernesto Sampra, and Alvaro Uribe of having links to drug cartels. Escobar's widow, Maria Hanayo, now Maria Isabel Santos Caballero, San Juan Pablo now Sebastian Maraquin Santos, and daughter, Manuela Plantafin Santos, and daughter, Manuela, led Colombia in 1995, after failing to find the country that would grant them asylum. Despite Escobar's numerous and continual infidelities, Maria remained supportive of her husband. Members of the Cali cartel even replayed their recordings of her conversations with Pablo for their wives to demonstrate how a woman should behave. This attitude proved to be the reason the cartel did not kill her and her children after Pablo's death. Although the group demanded and received millions of dollars in reparations for Escobar's war against them, and now even successfully negotiated for her son's life by personally guaranteeing he would not seek revenge against the cartel or participate in the drug trade. After escaping first to Mozambique, then to Brazil, the family settled in Argentina. Living under her assumed name, Henayo became a successful real estate entrepreneur until one of her business associates discovered her true identity and Henayo absconded with her earnings. Local media were alerted, and after being exposed as Escobar's widow, he now was imprisoned for 18 months while her finances were investigated. Ultimately, authorities were unable to link her funds to illegal activity, and she was released. According to her son, Inayo fell in love with Escobar because of his naughty smile and the way he looked at her. He was affectionate and sweet, a great lover. I fell in love with his, his desire to help people and his compassion for their hardship. We would drive to places where he dreamed of building schools for the poor. From the beginning, he was always a gentleman. Maria Victoria Henayo de Escobar, with her new identity as Maria Isabel Santos Caballero, continues to live in Buenos Aires with her son and daughter. On 5 June 2018, the Argentine federal judge Nestor Barrow accused her and her son, Sebastian Maraquin Santos, of money laundering with two Colombian drug traffickers. The judge ordered the seizing of assets for about one dollar each Argentinian filmmaker Nicolas Ento's documentary Sins of My Father, 2009, chronicles Maraquin's efforts to seek forgiveness on behalf of his father from the sons of Rodrigo Lara, Colombia's justice minister who was assassinated in 1984, as well as from the sons of Luis Carlos Galán, the presidential candidate who was assassinated in 1989. The film was shown at the 2010 Sundance Film Festival and premiered in the U.S. on H. Bay in October 2010. In 2014, Marroquin published Pablo Escobar, My Father Under His Birth Name, the book provides a first-hand insight into details of his father's life and describes the fundamentally disintegrating effect of his death upon the family. Maraquin aimed to publish the book in hopes to resolve any inaccuracies regarding his father's excursions during the 1990s. Escobar's sister, Luz Maria Escobar, also made multiple gestures in attempts to make amends for the drug baron's crimes.
These include making public statements in the press, leaving letters on the graves of his victims, and on the 20th anniversary of his death, organizing a public memorial for his victims. Escobar's body was exhumed on 28 October 2006 at the request of some of his relatives in order to take a DNA sample to confirm the alleged paternity of an illegitimate child and remove all doubt about the identity of the body that had been buried next to his parents for 12 years. A video of the exhumation was broadcast by RCN angering Marroquin who accused his uncle Roberto Escobar and cousin Nicolas Escobar of being merchants of death by allowing the video to air. After Escobar's death, the ranch, zoo, and citadel at Hacienda Napoles were given by the government to low-income families under a law called Extinction de Dominio. The main extinction, the property has been converted into a theme park surrounded by four luxury hotels overlooking the zoo. In 2014, Roberto Escobar founded Escobar Inns with Olaf K. Gustafsson and registered successor in interest rights for his brother Pablo Escobar in California, United States. Escobar kept four hippos in a private menagerie at Hacienda Napolis. They were deemed too difficult to seize and move after Escobar's death and hence left on the untended estate by 2007, the animals had multiplied to 16 and had taken to roaming the area for food in the nearby Magdalena River. In 2009, two adults and one calf escaped the herd and after attacking humans and killing cattle, one of the adults called Pipa was killed by hunters under authorization of the local authorities. As of early 2014, 40 hippos have been reported to exist in Puerto Triunfo, and the Aquia Department from the original four belonging to Escobar. Without management, the population size is likely to more than double in the next decade. The National Geographic Channel produced a documentary about them titled Cocaine Hippos. A report published in a Yale student magazine noted that local environmentalists are campaigning to protect the animals, although there is no clear plan for what will happen to them. In 2018, National Geographic published another article on the hippos which found disagreement among environmentalists on whether they were having a positive or negative impact. But that conservationists and locals, particularly those in the tourism industry, were mostly in support of their continued presence. By October 2021, the Colombian government had started a program of chemically sterilizing the animal. On 22 February 2019 at 11.53 a.m. local time, Medellin authorities demolished the six-story Edificio Monaco apartment complex in the El Poblado neighborhood where, according to retired Colombian General Rosso Jose Serrano, Escobar planned some of his most brazen attacks. The building was initially built for Escobar's wife but was gutted by a Cali cartel car bomb in 1988 and had remained unoccupied ever since, becoming an attraction to foreign tourists seeking out Escobar's physical legacy. Mayor Federico Gutierrez had been pushing to raise the building and erect in its place a park, honoring the thousands of cartel victims, including four presidential candidates and some 500 police officers. Colombian President Ivan Duke said the demolition means that history is not going to be written in terms of the perpetrators, but by recognizing the victims, hoping the demolition would showcase that the city had evolved significantly and had more to offer than the legacy left by the cartel.